But we're talking about possessions and money and giving. And I know some of you, now right now you're having an emotional allergic reaction, some of you on the inside. So deep breath. I know some of you have been around some really, maybe let's just say not so great environments with this topic. And you've got some history and background, maybe churches and messages and theology that just haven't handled it well. So here's my, here's my request to you and my, and my commitment to you. My, my request of you is this. Would you just take a deep breath right now and just kind of for the next 35 minutes or so, just lower your internal defense mechanisms and whatever rationalizations or perhaps let go of some bad experiences of the past. And would you just commit right now to be fully present to the Lord? You're already here with your physical body or perhaps joining us online. Don't turn off right now. Like, stay with us online for a moment at least. And just say, well, perhaps God has you here on this day at this time with this text because he wants to say something to you. The God we've gathered, in whose name we've gathered, the God that we worship and serve, I believe is a personal and communicating and present and cares about the details of our lives. And I believe he's got something to say to all of us, myself included. And maybe you'll hear something from God today. Maybe you'll hear today, hey, when it comes to your money and your finance and stuff, good job. Way to go. Stay at it. You're piling up treasures in heaven. Maybe you'll hear that today. Or maybe you'll hear today something like, hey, caution, careful. You're headed down a path. There's a lot at stake here. You might want to step back and think about some things. Or maybe you're going to hear today a little more of a a stern word. Maybe Jesus saying, hey, repent, because the spirit of mammon has some claws into your heart, and it's going to lead you to a place you don't want to be. And today's a day you can become free. And so in this space, like, there's so much history when it comes to the church speaking about money. We don't lack for headlines, right? The latest headline that scrolls of the latest ministry or church or not-for-profit that kind of made a mess of things financially. And into that space that Thomas Aquinas reminds us how important it is we talk about this. Aquinas' words are the following. Look, ordering things rightly and governing them well is at the heart of our faith. So here, Aquinas is saying this, your your financial formation is tied to your spiritual formation. Like learning how to handle money well is intricately tied to the kind of person you become. It really affects your development as a person. And here's what we know about just growing up as humans. Like maturity involves handling money wisely. Immaturity would be handling money foolishly that there's a connection between your growth and maturity as a person and the way you handle the stuff that's entrusted to you. And Aquinas is bringing up, this is actually a marker of our faith. And here's the deal. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been given a new covenant heart. What a beautiful gift it is. You're given a new covenant heart that has a stream of grace flowing in it. And that stream of grace has a momentum that goes towards a place of generosity. Deep inside of you wants to be generous, longs to be generous. If you know Jesus, that's the momentum going inside of your heart. Because you've been connected to a God who is abundantly generous to you by his love and his mercy and his grace. In a little while, we're going to go to the communion table. And the communion table communicates the riches of his love and grace that have been poured out for you. So when you get linked up to a God who is abundantly generous, there is a momentum inside of you that flows towards generosity. That's called a new covenant heart. But here's what we also know. There's a whole lot of lines in our culture and in our lives and in our own hearts that try to sabotage that vision of generosity. And that's the text that Jesus is pressing on the disciples. So Luke 16 This is what he's talking about in this chapter. If you know Luke 16, if you look in your Bibles, the section just before Jen read is the parable of the shrewd manager. And Jesus tells this story to make a point, and verse 10 to 15 is he's applying the parable to their everyday lives. And he's helping them understand this connection between financial formation and spiritual formation. Because we've been asking all through the Lenten season, how are things with your heart? How are things with your heart? And Jesus would say, hey, one of the ways you kind of monitor things with your heart is ask how things are going with finances and money and stuff and possessions. 
And so we're going to look at three things from this text. If you have your notes, you can pull those out. Online hosts will direct you online community accordingly. So we're going to look at, from verse 10 to 12, we're going to look at how handling wealth is a window into our character. Then we're going to look at verse 13, how serving mammon becomes a god. Notice little g that demands allegiance. And then we're going to look at verse 14 and 15, crucifying greed is the groundwork for developing generosity. So handling wealth, serving mammon, and crucifying greed. Greed. So let's get going here in verse 10 where Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. From that, I've said handling wealth is a window into our character. Because Jesus said it even more succinctly in the Sermon on the Mount, where your treasure is, there what? There your heart will be also. So it's a window like the stuff that's going on with our finances is like a light that shines like what's going on in here which is why we get a little bit of a a reaction. We get a little guarded when we step into this space because it can be pretty exposing and revealing in our hearts. And Lynn Twist wrote a book. I put it in your notes because I commend it to you highly. It's called The Soul of Money. I can't recommend it enough. If you need a good read on this subject, start with this one. In the book, she talks about this. This is the quote in your notes. Like water, money is a carrier. It can carry blessed energy, possibility, and intention, or it can carry control, domination, and guilt. It can be a current or a currency of love, a conduit for commitment, or a carrier of hurt or harm. We can be flooded with money and drown in excess, and when we dam it up unnecessarily, we keep it out of circulation to the detriment of others." So I want us for the next several minutes to think this through a little bit and kind of frame it this way. Say, hey, if you maintain the current relationship you have with money, now students in the room are saying, Pastor Eric, I'd like to have some money to have some relationship with. I understand. So students, there is a day coming when you're actually going to get a consistent paycheck by God's grace. At least that's how your parents are praying for your education to eventually manifest in a functional job that receives an income that you will steward. So students, you will eventually be entrusted. Here's what I want us to think about. However, your relationship that you have with money right now, run the tape out on that 10, 15, 20 years. Where does that end you? Where's that going to go? Think about that. The way you're handling it right now, run it out 10, 15, 20 years. When the subject of money comes up, like right now, what's the atmosphere of your heart surrounding this topic? Like when this topic's brought up, is it anxiety, like you just get super anxious, like the topic just brings a sense of dread in your heart? Is it fear? The moment money comes up, you immediately go down the road of, jeez, I don't know this month especially, I don't know that there's going to be enough. What do I do if I run out? Is it apathy? Apathy? Like, do you have this posture when it comes to this subject where you say, I don't know, I don't care, and I don't think much about it? Which, parenthesis, if you don't know and you don't care and you don't think much about it, that means there are people in your life that you're connected to who do know, who do care, and who do think about it. It's that important. Or maybe there's a place, is it a place of peace and contentment? Have you got to that place with your money where Jesus has this vision that you can actually be connected to God in such a way that you know he's faithful to provide your daily bread? That's what we were praying through in our prayer set at 9 a.m. this morning. Give us today our daily bread. Have you come to know a God who does that for you? Who provides for you what you need day by day? And there's a place where you find it's not all on your shoulders. That that grip that mammon has on your heart can be loosened under his Lordship and authority. What's the current relationship you have when it comes to money and finance and stuff? One of the joys that Kendra and I have right now in this season of parenting is we get to watch our wonderful daughters grow up into an adulting phase of life. It's really fun to watch as parents. I love our girls. We've got a senior in college and a freshman in college. And Lily's about to graduate in May with her master's degree, and Kaylin's a freshman at, at Lee, and just super proud of them. They're amazing young ladies. I know I'm biased, but I think they're top shelf in every way. But one of the joys I had was just a few years ago, um, Lily, she stepped into this space of owning an, an automobile. She got a car. And we sat down with her at the kitchen table, and we laid out the car insurance paperwork in front of her. And we said, this is called insurance coverage, and here's what's called a premium, and here's how this works. And she looked at it, and she said, wow, that's a lot. 
It's like 900 and some dollars for the year to insure a car. So well, you could pay it in quarterly payments. It'd be like $975 or something. What do you want to do, honey? She says, well, I want to pay it bulk all at once because it saves a little money. So she sits down. She writes the $900 check. She puts it in the mail and mails it off. And she said, that's a lot, Dad. I said, yeah. A year later, a bill from Erie Insurance arrives at our house with her name on it. And Lily got the bill, and she, she looked at it, and she called me. And she said, Dad, I just got a bill from Erie Insurance for the car insurance. She said, but I paid that. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, honey? It was a year ago. And I said, yeah, what's it say? It says, well, now they're wanting $950 for the year. I said, well, the premium went up. And she goes, wait a minute. I have to do this every year? I said, every year, honey. She thought it was, I go, she said, I thought it was a one and done deal. I said, well, honey, do you know when you drive downtown to major cities and you see these really big buildings, there's often an insurance company, the name on the title on the side of them. You're helping pay for those wonderful scrapers in the sky. She just had this, it was a, it was a wonderful parenting moment. I was just rejoicing, right? Watching your kids grow up and begin to understand, oh gosh, that's how the insurance industry works every single year. Richard Foster, in his book, The Freedom of Simplicity, he shares this list I put in your notes. I found it super helpful. It's his list of saying how he's tried to navigate his financial formation in the way of Jesus over the course of his life. And Foster says, here's how he's tried to approach it. Buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. Reject anything that's producing an addiction in you. Develop a habit of giving things away. Refuse to be propagandized by the custodians of modern gadgetry. He wrote this long before the iPhone generation. Imagine what he'd say today. Learn to enjoy things without owning them. Develop a deeper appreciation for the creation. Look with healthy skepticism at all the buy now, pay later schemes. Obey Jesus' instruction about plain, honest speech. Reject anything that breeds the oppression of others. And listen to this last one. Shun anything that distracts you from seeking first the kingdom of God. In the language of Luke 16, church, that's how you become a person who can be entrusted with much. See, Jesus says there's a connection between your financial formation, your relationship with money, and your spiritual formation, your relationship with Jesus. They are intricately connected. There's a window into your character and heart through money and possessions and stuff, which leads us into our second point that he gets into in unpacking the parable. He says in verse 13, serving mammon becomes a God that demands allegiance. Notice little g. Verse 13, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some of your Bibles say God and mammon. Do you see that translation you have in your Bibles? Because the root word there is for mammonas. It actually means in the Greek money or riches or wealth, but in Aramaic it's translated mammon. And some of your translators held the Aramaic term there. So mammon, it has the idea, this word, this term that embodies whatever God entrusts you with with riches and wealth and money, mammon, that's the term. And Jesus says there's a, there's a way of going about relating to mammon, that it can get a place in your heart, that can get to the place of beginning to master your life and can begin to demand the affections and allegiance of your heart. And that's a dangerous place that Jesus is saying, you, 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 gotta, get this, you gotta get this sorted out. Because there'll be something that's happening. It'll start taking you to a place you don't want to be if mammon gets to that place where it starts demanding attention from the affections, affections of your heart. Michael Easter wrote a book called Scarcity Brain. I put a quote in your notes. Scarcity Brain, here, here's the premise of the book, is that he's trying to understand why is it in North American culture today we live with a perpetual mindset that it's never enough, that we're always going to run out. And he's trying to assess and unpack it. I don't think he's a follower of Jesus. It's not written from a Christian perspective. He's written just kind of a cultural analysis on this issue of scarcity and materialism and stuff. And he has a paragraph where he reflects on his own behavior during the pandemic. I put this quote in your notes. He said, I had nowhere to go and nowhere to be and a clock on my phone, which I looked at every five minutes. Yet I bought a ridiculously expensive luxury watch. I'd wear it around the house while dressed in $14 sweatpants from Target and a t-shirt I got for free from my dentist. <laughs> We've all been there. 
on your Zoom call, you're looking solid from here on up. <laughs> In one section of the book, he talks about machines, clothes, items, and houses. And in the machine section, he's talking about this premise that we make machines and then machines start shaping us. And he talks about the nail industry, hammer and nails. He said when the country of America was founded and nails began to be used, blacksmiths, when they were at their peak production, would take one minute of a blacksmith's working, 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 one minute to produce one nail. Nails were so valuable that arsonists would burn down houses to harvest the nails. Today, the machines in the nail industry, 360 nails per minute. We make machines and our machines make us. The clothing industry in America, when America was founded, the average American owned three outfits. Even Thomas Jefferson's wife, Martha, they said she owned an outlandish 17 outfits. They said it was breathtaking, 17. Today, the average American purchases 37 items of clothing every year and stores in their now walk-in closets, which wasn't even a term back then, walk-in closets now house the average of 107 items. When I read it, I thought, that's kind of small. From some of the walk-in closets, I'm looking at my house, or I'm walking in some of your house, I'm, I don't think that's big enough. 107 items is the average. And then the study went on to say, what do we think about our 107 items? So here's, the, here's what we say. When we walk into our closet, we say 21% of it unwearable. We say 57% of it, too tight, too baggy. We say 12% of it, we're just, we've never worn. We don't even know. Still has the tags on it, 12%, which leaves us back to Martha Jefferson data. Basically, today, we have about 11 different seek outfit combinations in our closets that we actually functionally wear. Now, some of you parenting middle schoolers, you're like, that's high, Pastor Eric. You got like maybe three. If you got a middle school boy, you're looking at rotating three, right? You're just trying to get them. Hey, bud, can we change out those shorts like you've had them a good seven straight days? <laughs> Eleven items. All of that when the EPA then says, this year, Americans, Americans this year will throw away 68 pounds of clothing per person per year. If you stopped by the Goodwill bin over here and you've gone to the clothing bin like I've done many times, I've contributed our pounds of clothing to that. Just piles and piles of clothing. 68 pounds a year. It's spilled over to our pets. Do you know that the dog clothing industry? I'm thankful we have not crossed into this with Ollie. The closest thing he has to dog clothing is his thunder vest, which he hates when the thunderstorms come. But dog clothing industry is rocketing up and to the right. It's going to become a $16.5 billion, billion dollar industry. Some of you are like, you missed the market on that one, didn't you? Mary Oliver wrote a poem about all this. She said, I own a house, small but comfortable. In it is a bed, a desk, a kitchen, a closet, a telephone, and so forth. You know how it is. Things collect. You know how it is. Things collect. The average American home has 10,000 pounds of stuff in it. And our homes have grown 75% since 1910. The average home now is 2,500 square feet. But it's not big enough. Because the new industry that's growing at a more rapid pace than virtually anything else is the self-storage business entity. Did you know, I, this, I, I read this three times in, scarcities, in, in Michael Easter's books on scarcity. He said there are more self-storage units in America, more self-storage units in America today than there are Starbucks, McDonald's, Burger King, or Walmart combined. Yeah, that's what I said, Bob. Really? So I say all that data as a backdrop to Jesus' statement now. Listen to this. How poignant are Jesus' words in Luke 12? What might he say 
to us today in 2024. Luke 12, 15. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Oh. You good? We good? Like mammon is so subtle in how it sneaks into our hearts and starts getting its grip on us. Have you noticed that? It's just like an Instagram story, a TikTok feed, LinkedIn profile. Three clicks and the algorithms have you. Tim Keller said it this way, money flows effortlessly to that which is its God. Money flows effortlessly to that which is its God. Which is why Jesus is pressing this hard. It's why he's pushing in on this space with the disciples and now pushes into us today and says, hey, how are things with your heart concerning money? What's your relationship with money like? How is it affecting who you're becoming? If you maintain that relationship, where's this going 15, 20 years out? And then has it... Has mammon creeped into this place where you're literally bowing with allegiance and giving the affections of your life because it's become a God that's demanding its attention? Is it starting to drag you away into that space? Because, as Keller said, money flows effortlessly to that which is its God. Which is why Jesus, when he really wants to know perhaps what's going on in here with priorities, he wants to talk about money and possessions and stuff. So the first point here, handling wealth is a window into our character. Second point, serving mammon becomes a God that demands allegiance, which leads us to the third and perhaps most poignant section of his teaching, crucifying greed is the groundwork for developing generosity. And that's what he says in 14 and 15, and he uses the Pharisees as kind of a a living illustration. Though the Pharisees didn't realize they were the living illustration, which was part of the problem. said, the Pharisees, notice your text says, who loved what? Who loved money heard all this, heard all what? Heard the story, heard his explanation. And how was their response? They were sneering at Jesus. I'll get into that in a minute. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your what? See that? So the Pharisees who loved money, they sneer at Jesus, shining a spotlight on their divided heart. Jesus is taking a spotlight and saying, do you see how divided your heart is with this issue, Pharisees? And their response, the word sneer in the original means to turn your nose up in derision, to mock greatly. It's the ultimate condescension, which is ironic when this is the group of people. The backdrop of the Pharisees were, they were the religious police of the New Testament. They were supposed to be the one to help people seek God and walk with God. They were the ones who had the stack of books that knew the stack of laws. The Pharisees had a chapter and a verse and a spiritual and religious answer for anything. Big problem was what? They didn't have the life. They had religion. They had answers, they had chapter and verse, they internalized laws, but they missed Jesus. And one of the illustrations here is one of the reasons they missed Jesus is because of greed and mammon. They actually were staring at the Son of God and sneering, mocking in a condescending way at the Son of God who were supposed to be in positions to help people seek God. Does anybody see the irony of that? Notice he didn't go after the wealthy and the powerful of the land and that. He he went straight to the religious leaders and said, actually, you're the ones. It's a sobering text that they could become so deeply entrenched with religion and money that they missed Jesus. And little did we know what a commentary that would be on the religious trajectory of our world. And the Bible records a sobering account of this. This isn't just a one and done situation in your Bibles. I put a little summary in your notes. You can maybe glance at these later, work through them. If if greed doesn't get crucified, here's what the Bible says, if greed doesn't get dealt with in the heart. In Joshua 7, Achan's love of money brought disaster to himself, his family, and his nation. In Numbers 22 to 24, Numbers 31, Balaam's love of money caused him to foolishly attempt to curse God's chosen people and resulted in his death. 
Judges 16, Delilah's love of money led her to betray Samson and ultimately led to the death of thousands. And then in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they loved money. It led them to boldly lie about their giving and it cost them their life. A little summary, loving money makes people dot, dot, dot. Here's a list from the scriptures. It makes you forget God, trust in their riches, be deceived, compromise convictions and be proud, steal from God and ignore the needs of others, which is why Jesus would sound this alarm. Verse Luke 12, 15, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. We good? You okay? Come up for air here for a second. Let's look at this for what it is. Jesus says, this is how much is on the line with this topic. There's a lot at stake here. See, the false narrative, remember we talked about that a few weeks ago? Part of the journey of walking with Jesus is kind of undoing the false narratives and false scripts that we adopt in our lives and begin to reform and reshape our thinking, allow us to have the mind of Christ to be shaped by the word of God. The false narrative about all this stuff is that Things, stuff, money brings happiness. That's the false narrative. Like things, stuff, money, they make you feel secure, powerful, successful. That's the false narrative. Jesus says you got to undo that narrative and you get to adopt the kingdom narrative. Here's Jesus' kingdom narrative, 1 Timothy 6, 17. This is the kingdom narrative. Don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God. That's the kingdom narrative. Jesus' kingdom narrative is, I'm not what I have, I'm not what I do, I'm not what others say about me, I am a child of God. That's your kingdom narrative. I'm not what I have, I'm not what I do, I'm not what others say about me, I am a child of God. And a child of God has been given a new covenant heart. And there is a stream of grace flowing in your heart that you know deep down everything you have is an extension of his abundant goodness and grace being poured out on your life. And there's momentum in your heart to loosen the grip and to be generous. But there's a lot of things that got, and one of the primary is greed has got to get dealt with at the core of your soul or you'll never make your headway towards what I've entitled today, a generous life. Tim Keller put it this way. I put this quote in your notes as well. That's the reason why fundamentally, hear this, Christianity is a different economic system because capitalism actually says, whose money is it? It's your money, and you can do what you want. You can do with it what you want. Fundamentally, communism and socialism say, whose money is it? It's the people's, and you must do with it as the community needs. Christianity, hear this, says, whose money is it? It's God's, and you must do as he directs. Those are three fairly different approaches, wouldn't you say? And so church, one of the greatest joys of my life pastoring with you over these years has have, is having a front row seat to your ongoing and abundant generosity. The way some of you over the years have stewarded what God's entrusted to you has been so inspiring and challenging to me personally. It's beautiful to watch. It's a testimony of the new covenant heart you've been given. That you just so freely release, that you live with, you've kind of crucified this this grip of mammon. You've dealt with greed. You've, by his grace, gotten to a place where you recognize everything you have is his, and you just kind of freely give it away, and you don't do it reluctantly. You do it joyfully. And you're the ones who call and say, how can I help? How can I give? What needs more money? What needs more help? How can we move this down? You know who you are. We've had an eyewitness to this year after year. It's a testimony of one of the legacies of this body over the last 32 years. An abundantly generous spirit flowing through so many. And it's been beautiful. And I just want to position today with Jesus and say, that's actually not supposed to be exceptional Christian life. It's supposed to be normal Christian life. That that's for someone who's maybe been entrusted with, in the eyes of the world, very little, or someone who's been entrusted with much, that the posture that Jesus says should flow out of everyone with a new covenant heart is a generous life. Because everything we have is his. Jesus is trying to connect the dots today between financial formation and spiritual formation. So I ask you, how are things? How are things with your heart today? And when this subject comes up, what's the spotlight revealing? 
What's it exposing in the character on the inside? What's it showing you about mammon and how mammon is it? Is it jockeying for a godlike position? And where are you at with greed? Have you allowed the cross of Christ to kind of crucify the core of greed in your heart to get you to the place where you can kind of loosen the grip and actually begin to experience freedom? Jesus said that, that's his vision. Like that's normal Christian life. No matter what he entrusts you with. And so worship team, come on back up. I got one final story, and then I'm going to invite us to the communion table for an application. So I want to close by telling you about Selena Shirley. Selena Shirley married Theophilus Hastings, the Earl of Huntington, in 1728 in England. She became a follower of Jesus in her 20s a few years after she got married. She met Jesus. And she began to walk with God, and she was entrusted with a lot. She was called the Lady of Huntington. Lady Huntington married the Earl of Huntington. They had a massive estate, tremendous wealth, great influence in England at that time. Her husband, at the age of 39, unexpectedly dies of a stroke. So she's now a widow. And then two of her four children die of smallpox. So she's now a grieving widow, having lost children and a follower of Jesus, and she takes her grief and her loss. She's so young. She's young in her face. She begins to cry out to God, and now she's sitting here with this massive estate and all this wealth and grieving a husband, grieving losing children. She said, God, what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do with my one and only life and all this stuff? Like, and she had heard about a man named George Whitfield who was traveling around England at that time doing these open-air meetings and inviting people to come to Christ. And she had heard that there was really crazy stuff going on in these open-air meetings. But people in Lady Huntington circles, they don't go to the open field meetings. That's not, of their, that's not their group. So she sensed from the Lord, hey, send a letter to George Whitfield. Ask him to come to your house and talk to him. So she sends communication to George Whitfield. Whitfield gets this communication from Lady Huntington, which everyone would know that name in that time, in that era, in that part of the country. And Whitfield shows up at her house. And Lady Huntington says this to George Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, I watched God save souls through the light of his glorious gospel. And now I see the one thing worth living for must be the proclaiming of the love of God to man in Jesus Christ. I am nothing Christ is all. Widow, buried two children. I am nothing, Christ is all. So she proposed a partnership with George Whitfield. Lady Huntington said this, Mr. Whitfield, I will open up my home and I will invite all my circles of influence, all my relationships, I'm going to invite them to come to our estate on Tuesday and Thursday evening. Will you come? Will you do what you do, which is open the gospel of Christ and speak to this group of people? I'll do what I do, which is host them and care for them and open up our home. Because she said this to him, Mr. Whitfield, there are people that will come to my palace that will never come to your church. They'll never come to your open air meetings. But you know what I, she said, but my heart is burdened, Mr. Whitfield, for them. They're caught up in the third soil. Jesus loves them, but the deceitfulness of wealth and the cares of this life are choking it out and they can't see. So, Mr. Whitfield, I'm asking you to come. And by the power of the Spirit of God, you'll help open their spiritual eyes. Will you come? If you're George Whitfield, what are you going to say to that? He wasn't lacking for things to do, if you know Whitfield. And so he says yes. He shows up the first Tuesday evening. She invites all, and then the place is packed. It's the who's who of England to the point where the kitchen staff are all like whispering and like saying, did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see? It's the who's who of everyone is there. And in classic George Whitfield style, he steps forward after Lady Huntington introduces him. And here's his opening text, the opening sermon at the Lady Earl of Huntington's palace in front of all the who's who of England. Matthew 19, 24, Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. You good? <laughs> they said it was pin drop silence in the palace. I imagine so. And after the talk was over, Mr. Whitfield said there were quite a conversations occurred. 
And it was the who's who strolling up to Mr. Whitfield and said, Mr. Whitfield, you've given me a lot to think about. I want to hear you again. Reminded you, right? If you know your New Testament, it's what they said of the Apostle Paul when he would go into settings. Like, I'm not sure I agree with everything. I want to hear you again. And so every Tuesday and Thursday, he kept coming back. And guess who kept coming back? The who's who of England kept coming back. And guess who started coming to Christ? Can you picture the ripple effect? The most elite of the elite in the places of power by society began to become followers of Jesus because Lady Huntington said, hey, George Whitfield, I'm going to fund your ministry. I'm going to get behind you. I'm going to fund it. This is what I'm supposed to do with my one and only life and these treasures and possessions. And that partnership continued for years and years and years. And here's where it eventually grew to. They together launched 116 preaching places in England. They were called chapels back then. And they launched a seminary to train up more pastors that would do what Whitfield's doing. And by the time of Whitfield's death, Whitfield died at 55, quite young. Lady Huntington outlived him by 20 years. At the time of his death, here's what it said of George Whitfield. Four-fifths, four-fifths of the American colonies had heard Whitfield preach the gospel of Christ. By the time of his death, four-fifths. An estimated 18,000 sermons, he preached 10 per week for 34 consecutive years, 500 sermons a year. When he died, Lady Huntington didn't know. George Whitfield, in his will, wrote, give everything I have to Lady Huntington. He gave everything he had to her. He didn't have much, but he gave it all to her because he knew this. She would steward it for the proclamation of the gospel. Because he wrote in his will, give it to Lady Huntington to serve, listen, all gospel ministers. She will use it to train seminary students and church planners, quote, to take the good news of Jesus and remove all the unreached areas of England. Church, some historians say that George Whitfield is the greatest preacher the English-speaking world has ever heard. Do you know that's what some historians say about Whitfield? The single greatest preacher in the English-speaking world. Central figure to the 18th century revival in our own country and in the Reformation of England. And one can only wonder, church, what might have happened if Selina Shirley didn't offer her one and only life and resources to him? Selina Shirley became what I want to give you a, t- a term for from John Reinhardt's book. It's called a gospel patron. You heard that term before? I commend that book to you. Here's a picture of the book title. If you want to read something, especially those of you who've been trusted with a little bit in this life, with fear and trembling, open these pages, okay? And allow the Spirit to stir in your hearts a possibility. Because in the pages of the gospel patron book is not only the story I just told you of Whitfield, but then told about William Tyndale. Are you grateful for your English Bible? Do you know that behind William Tyndale, who gave his life, that we might have this Bible in English? Do you know that there was a gospel patron? There was a man, his name was Humphrey Monmouth. Do you know who Humphrey Monmouth is? Nobody's heard of Humphrey Monmouth. He funded William Tyndale to translate the Bible into English. Huh. Behind every great movement of God in history, church, are a few generous men and women. They're called gospel patrons. They've been trusted with, in God's sovereignty, they've been entrusted with more in this life for so that, that they might move Christ's purposes forward in this world. And so I close, church, by asking, I wonder if there's some Lady Huntingtons in the room or listening online. I wonder if there's some Humphrey Monmouths in the room. You know who you are? Some of you are so incredibly good at making money. That's not bad. That's a gift from God. You're so good at it. You just, whatever you put your hands to, it just seems to go up and to the right. Praise God. But deep down in your heart, hear this. There's something gnawing deep inside that there's a so that in all of that. That it's too small a thing. It's too small a thing for you just to make a ton of money pad the 401k, buy a second home, take care of the kids to college, set up the trust fund for the grandkids. Those aren't bad things. Jesus would say they're just too small. Too small. And I want to charge you today, Lady Huntington, Humphrey Monmouth, you who've been entrusted with much, why not you? Why not now? Why not for this moment? 
Why not you become the legacy you would leave? What if at the end of the run for you was gospel patron? What if you decided, you know what, you're just going to leverage all the dollars that flow through your hands? For some of you, that's millions of dollars. You're going to leverage them to go out like Lady Huntington went out. What might happen? And for others of you, even if you're not entrusted with that much, we all can be gospel patrons in some measure to just say, here's what I've got, Lord. It's all yours. I'm going to steward it. I'm going to get behind what you want me to get behind. Because church, we can't take any of this stuff with us, but here's what we do know. We can send it ahead of us. You know how you send it ahead of us? You store up treasures that are in heaven where moth and, moth and rust don't destroy. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So church, I invite you to the tables. This is a backdrop. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, in one hand, you're going to hold the communion elements. And in a moment, I want you to hold your other hand out in front of you. I want you to do this. And I want you to pause, perhaps with your families, do this together as a family or with a circle of friends. And here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about how the abundant riches of his love and grace poured out here is the pathway to a heart that relates to mammon and possessions and money, that a heart that gets like this. This is the key to this. And if there's some stuff that needs to get worked out in here, here's the power to shape what needs to happen right here, right here. And you just come to the table and you bring your whole life, which includes all your possessions, all your stuff, no matter how big or small it is, you say, Jesus, it's all yours. And I and we have been bought with this price. And what might the Lord do if out of today he commissioned dozens and dozens of Leite Huntingtons and Humphrey Monmouths to link up with modern-day George Whitfields? What might the legacy be written? Why not you? Why not me? Why not us? Why not now? Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much that you would confront and deal with a subject that's so personal and so, ah, it just hits in such a deep place. Thank you for Luke 16. Thank you for loving us enough to challenge us with where mammon, where does it sit in our hearts? So send your spirit now. Examine our hearts as we go to the tables. Lead us as an act of worship. We hold these elements the broken body and the shed blood, we hold them as an act of worship. And would you move us to the place that whatever it is you flow through these hands, be that hundreds or thousands or millions of dollars, would you, by the power of your spirit, release it to a place of generosity? Raise up an army of gospel patrons in this body, I pray in Jesus' holy name.